Well, today we have an off-quoted uh, passage of the Bible and an easygoing summer baseball movie to talk about. Okay, well, the first part's true. Uh, you know, sometimes you make plans and the Holy Spirit makes other plans, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, today, I want to start with today's passage, uh, though. And, and it is, this passage in Galatians is one that is probably fairly commonly known out there and one that is, is quoted um, often and, and, and for good reason. Um, because the book of Galatians itself uh, is actually a really uh, Im important book. Now, of course, all the books in the Bible are important. Um, but the book of Galatians is actually especially uh, important. And is it is especially important um, to those of us whose faith flows from the Protestant tradition. Uh, this was one of those go-to books uh, that Martin Luther and John Wesley uh, and John Calvin and all those early folks in the Protestant kind a Reformation movement uh, went to and drew, uh, derived a lot of wisdom from. Uh, and, and so Galatians itself is just a really, really rich text. And here, um, even though we're still kind of early in the book, we actually have Paul reaching almost like a crescendo moment. So, so Paul is the author um, of this letter, as he's the author of actually most of the New Testament. Um, and if you've read any of Paul, and especially if you've read throughout, like, say, an entire book, uh, you know he will, like, build up to these kind of uh, rhetorical moments, and there'll be the, this crescendo um, where he really kind of nails his point home, and then he'll kind of fall back down and, and kind of build it back up again. Uh, from a literary perspective, uh, Paul's letters are, are, are fairly fascinating and, and really rich. Uh, so now we have one of those sort of crescendo moments uh, here uh, being built where, where Paul's really... Um, building to a point, and, and here he's making it. Now, Paul has a problem, um, and oftentimes when Paul is writing letters uh, to communities, he's writing them because there's something that he needs to tell them about, there's something he needs to correct, uh, there's something that he perceives they didn't quite understand or are doing wrong, um, and he needs to offer them um, a different way of looking at things. And that is certainly the case in Galatians. Now, we're not entirely certain where Paul was writing to. Galatia may be referring to a town. It may be referring to an area. Uh, it may be a whole collections of faith communities. It may only be one. We're not quite certain. What we do know uh, is that these are faith communities that Paul himself set up, that during his missionary journeys, and several of them, he would go and spend, you know, six months to two years in all of these different communities, building up uh, little communities of faith, little pockets of, of followers of Christ. Um, and... And then he would go and do the next one. And people would report to him how his previous work was doing. Uh, and sometimes he would write those previous communities uh, letters to, to either encourage them or to correct something. So, and we know the names of those communities, Galatia, Thessalonica, um, you know, uh, all the rest of them, <laughs> whose names are escaping me at the moment. Um, so this is one of those letters that Paul's writing. Now, we don't have um, the letter he received, right? Like, we don't know, uh, you know, what people told him that prompted him to write this letter. Thankfully, he often tells us, right? Like, he, he doesn't tend to mince words, our Paul. Uh, and if he's taking on an idea or people, he'll, he'll typically name it. And in this case, he does. So we know pretty well what's happening. Uh, what, what obviously happened is after Paul left, got this community of faith going, um, other people arrived, other teachers arrived, um, probably from Jerusalem, and started to present, um, still present Jesus, um, but present the way of following Jesus different than the way that Paul presented it. And specifically, um, these were uh, followers of Jesus who were still themselves um, pretty devout Jews, which means they were following all the Mosaic laws and all those practices. And so they showed up in Galatia and found all these other, you know, Jesus Christ followers and uh, decided that uh, they uh, needed to help them better understand uh, what it was uh, to be in that role and what it was um, to, to be a Christ follower. And one of the things that they really tried to hammer home with these folks is that if you're going to be a Christ follower, 
well then you have to follow all the things that Christ did, which means you got to follow the law of Moses. And, and if you think about it, their logic is fairly sound. You know, Jesus himself was a Jew. He, for the most part, followed the Jewish rules, though we know from the Gospels that he didn't always and often got himself in trouble with teachers of the law for not doing it. Um, but his disciples were all themselves Jews um, and ostensibly themselves followers um, of Jewish law and Jewish custom. So it only makes sense that everybody who wanted to follow Jesus um, should have to do the same thing um, in all the same ways around the hand washings and the food you eat and the food you don't eat. And of course, the big one, uh, at least for the men in the group, was circumcision. Uh, and, and so they came and they presented this and said, no, 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 if you're going to follow Jesus, you, you have to look and act like us, right? You have to look and act like we think Jesus did. And if you're going to look and act, you know, if you're going to follow him and be like him, you have to look and act like him. So, so Paul gets wind that these teachers have arrived and have started to really confuse everybody because this was not in any way part of Paul's message, um, anyway, part of what he taught. Um, and, and so, you know, he has to, so he's writing this letter um, as a way to help them um, understand and re-clarify what it is that he taught him, which he firmly believes is the right way. So he talks first and foremost about this idea of the disciplinarian. Um, at least that's how this translation translated. Different translations translate that word differently. Um, disciplinarian isn't just a generic term. It's actually a, a job. Um, you know, in the, in the Greco-Roman world of Paul and Jesus and all that, um, oftentimes, especially well-to-do families, um, would either have a servant or a slave in their house who was responsible um, for the oldest son and responsible to keep the oldest son out of trouble because the oldest son was the one who was going to inherit. Um, and so the kind of the best analogy for us today may be kind of almost like a nanny figure, right? Like, like somebody, in the life, somebody in your life who's there in your early years to keep you on the straight and narrow, right? You don't have to do a lot of your own thinking. Um, this person is there um, to tell you uh, very quickly and easily what's the good thing to do, what's the bad thing to do, um, and, and to make sure that you stay out of trouble um, in those early years of your life. And so Paul is equating um, these rules that these folks are bringing with them, these rules that folks are trying to impose upon these Christ followers as the disciplinarian, right? That thing that is just there, um, you know, to help you understand very simply without a lot of thought or effort what is right and what is wrong. And Paul argues, he argues vehemently, that, that one of the primary purposes uh, of Jesus' coming um, was to sort of break us free of the disciplinarian, break us free um, of this very sort of simplistic way um, of viewing the world. Um, he, you know, Jesus came to give us a different understanding and different tools um, and, and really um, to uh, put us in a place where we ourselves, we ourselves, become responsible uh, for what it is that we do. We ourselves become responsible uh, for what it is we believe. We ourselves uh, become responsible to really understanding not just the basic do's and don'ts, but understanding uh, what the whole project has been about, that what God is about, that what being a person of faith is about, and what Jesus is being about. And then Paul goes on in those famous lines, there is no more Gentile or Jew, there is no more a slave or free, there is no more male or female. He's talking about these basically these boxes um, that we are born into, um, these boxes of our religious identity, our political identity, our biological uh, identity, these boxes that, we, that we're born into and live in and, and use to categorize uh, who is us and who is them, right? Who, who's on our side? Who's on the other side? Um, and so these teachers have come along and they have basically said, look, you, you can't, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, well, then you have to join us, you know, in, in, the, in the Jewish box, right? Like, you can come in here, like, it's fine if you want to follow Jesus, but you got to look like us. And you got to talk like us. and You got to act like us. And you got to do the things that we do. And so Paul comes in in this really kind of crazy, honest, almost radical moment. And he says, no, 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 no. God didn't come, Jesus didn't come, to move everybody into the same box. God came, Jesus came, 
to do something incredibly different. He came to tell you that those boxes, those boxes really don't matter. They don't matter nearly as much as you think they do. And in fact, there's something else that matters a whole lot more. So Paul has that problem. Now, in the movie for this week, 42, which of course is the Jackie Robinson story, uh, Jackie Robinson famously uh, was the baseball player who integrated baseball in the late 40s, uh, the first African-American uh, player to play, uh, for, and he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And going into this movie the first time I ever saw it, that's the piece I knew. I, I knew that piece. Um, and then I also knew that like Harrison Ford was playing somebody in the movie, but I didn't know who. Um, and, and because I was at least somewhat familiar with the Jackie Robinson story, um, as I'm sure most of us are, um, it's actually Harrison's Ford character. It's the Branch Rickey character, um, frankly, that I found, at least for me, a lot more interesting, a lot more fascinating, because Branch really has the same problem that, um, in many ways, that Paul had, right? He's managing a baseball team. He's trying to put together the best team he can, but there's this whole category of people that he's not allowed, apparently not allowed to use. There's no law against it. There's no um, rule against it. But there's a custom against using African-American players. There's a tradition. There's a gentleman's agreement um, that we don't do this. And so um, Branch, at this point, towards the end of his career, has, has watched um, all these amazing players, you know, come and go. And, and for some reason, he's not allowed by this custom to use these folks. And later in his life, he reaches a point where he's just driven to uh, the point where he just can't simply not do that any longer. Now, it's important to know a little bit about uh, Branch Rickey's background. They don't really go into the movie. Um, he was actually uh, attended school and was a graduate of Ohio Wesleyan University, uh, which is located actually about a couple of miles from where I went to seminary, uh, interestingly enough. And at the time that he was there, it was considered the West Point for missionaries, um, right? Uh, it, was, it was a very well thought of school. Um, he was an officer in World War I. Um, he was a Mason. Um, he was both a pro football and pro baseball player um, in the days kind of before the NFL and, and before uh, uh, the, 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 N, the National Baseball Association, um, uh, but still played professional ball. Um, he was a coach uh, and eventually moved in to management and would manage uh, many teams before uh, landing this role uh, with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And in the course of landing this role with the Brooklyn Dodgers, he actually became a 25% owner um, in the franchise. This is really what gave Branch the ability to do what he did. Not only been around forever, not only did he have the respect um, uh, of people, not only was he very well thought of um, as, a, as a person who really could identify talent and identify players, um, but as an owner, as part owner in the Brooklyn Dodgers, um, he had the ability uh, to corral the kind of support that otherwise nobody else probably would have had. And in fact, if you look at the world of the time and baseball at the time, there probably wasn't anybody but Branch Rickey who could do what he did. Now you add on top of that, he had a motivation. Sure, he had motivation to win baseball games and sell tickets and all those sorts of things. But as the movie explores, Branch was also a deep person of faith. And, and I love in one of the early lines in the film when they're discussing uh, using Jackie Robinson in this role, uh, Branch has this great line, which apparently didn't actually happen, but it's a Hollywood moment, but it's still a good moment, uh, where he says, well, he's a Methodist and I'm a Methodist and God's a Methodist. And I just pretty laughed at that tremendously. Uh, but this was also true. Um, you know, Branch himself was a, was, a, was a devout Methodist, had been a Methodist his whole life. Um, Jackie Robinson, though it's not really portrayed in the movie, was himself um, a person of faith and was, in fact, um, a, a Methodist. So, so Branch had all of these sort of, um, not only the ability uh, to do something, but all these different um, motivations uh, to do it as well, um, and different, and, and, and these really powerful forces driving him, knowing full well, knowing full well that whoever he picked would take a great deal of abuse, knowing that he himself and his team would take a great deal of abuse, that it would probably cost him something personally and financially um, early on um, as, as part of it, um, and that, that what he was doing was more uh, about long-term change than any sort of immediate 
change and that the immediate change that actually is going to happen was, was probably going to be painful. And as the movie powerfully shows, it certainly was. The problem that Paul is facing is he doesn't want anybody to believe they're automatically disqualified from the love and grace of Jesus Christ by which box they happen to be born into. Branch has the same problem. He doesn't believe anybody should be automatically disqualified, yes, from the game of baseball because of the box they're born into, but it is about more than that for him. He doesn't believe that anybody should be automatically disqualified from participation in all areas of society because of a box that they are born into. So, so Branch, like Paul, decides to do something about it as probably the only one who could. Now, there's a crescendo moment in the movie, much like the crescendo moment uh, in the book of Galatians that we read. Um, and it comes towards the end uh, when Jackie Robinson and Branch are having this conversation about really, no, no, really tell me, Branch, why are you doing this? I want us to watch that clip real quick right now. Why'd you do it? Come on. Tell me. I love this game. I love baseball. Give my whole life to it. Forty odd years ago, I was a player coach at Ohio Wesleyan University. We had a Negro catcher, best hitter on the team, Charlie Thomas, fine young man. So I'm laid low, broken because of the color of his skin and I didn't do enough to help. I told myself I did, but I didn't. There was something unfair at the heart of the game I loved and I ignored it. But a time came when I could no longer do that. You. You let me love baseball again. Thank you. <clears throat> so Branch had seen how unfair his world could be, and it had taken him decades, but he'd finally reached a place uh, where he was willing and able to do something about it. Now, today, uh, we may read the passages like we read uh, in Galatians and go, well, that's great, but we don't, we don't live in those categories anymore. We don't think about people in terms, um, you know, of Jews and Gentiles or, you know, uh, we, we got rid of slavery. Uh, you know, what's the big deal for us today? But if we're honest, if we're truly honest, we have to recognize we've, we've sort of just built some new boxes for us, right? The, some boxes that we are born into, Right? So are, maybe you're born into a religious or a non-religious family. Uh, you're born an American uh, or a foreigner. You're born gay or straight. Right? And we've also developed uh, boxes that we opt into. And then these sometimes are even more powerful for us. Right? The box of Republican or Democrat, Protestant or, or Catholic, uh, Gryffindor or Ravenclaw, Myers-Briggs, ENF. P, Enneagram 7, right? Like, like all you got to do is spend any amount of time scrolling through Facebook. Like, which Disney princess are you, right? Like, all, anything the world can do to put us in a box. And yet the message that we receive from God, the message we receive from Christ, is the message that Paul was proclaiming uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, it was the message that Pranch Ricky was trying to help us understand uh, 75 years ago, that none of those boxes that we're either born into or put ourselves into automatically qualifies us or disqualifies us from a life of faith, disqualifies us or qualifies us for God's love and grace. That, that those boxes, as important as they seem um, uh, to us, and some of them, let's be honest, feel really important. But none of those boxes matter nearly as much as we think they do. And instead, there's something else that matters far more. I wear on my wrist... Um, 
pretty much all the time. Uh, reminders of three of the things um, that matter most to me and that I think and I hope matter to us as a community. And when I think about the kind of person I want to be and the kind of person that I want to be and the kind of people that I want to be around, I try hard not to think um, about people who might vote like me or look like me or like the same music that I like. I try to not be in those boxes, but instead I try to live into and find other people who are trying to live into the same things that I am. And those things are, I'm striving, striving to love God and love neighbor and love myself. I want to be around other people who are doing that. I'm striving to recognize that I am loved exactly as I stand here right now, as imperfect and as flawed as I am. I am loved by God, and God is challenging me to become more than I am right now. And I want to be around other people, and I want to be in, in ministry and in life and go through life with people who are striving for the same thing, the same kind of understanding. And finally, I recognize that I can't do everything, and then the world is full of things I can't fix, probably now more than ever. But I can do something, and I want to be around people. I want to be with people. I want to share space and prayer with people who also want to find the something that they're supposed to do. Branch couldn't fix racism in America. Jackie Robinson couldn't fix racism in America. Working together, they couldn't fix racism in America. But there's something they could do. They could find a way to let a person who was obviously gifted to play baseball, play baseball. They could take the slings and the arrows and, and, and the real powerfully terrible mistreatment that was slung at them. They could take it in stride and continue on and point out the truth. When it comes to baseball, what should matter is, can you play baseball? Not what arbitrary box we may have filed you in. And it what comes to us as people of faith in the tradition of Christ and the tradition of Paul, what matters it's not what you look like. What matters not um, is where you come from. What matters is are you willing to love or at least try to love the way that God loved? Are you willing to find and embrace the hope that God offers us? Are you going to strive to find the something that God has for you to do? In the end, that's all that really matters. It's simply and quite frankly all that matters to me. And I think if all of us are honest about who we want to be and honest about who God calls us to be, it's all that should really matter to any of us. Amen.